Okay, we're in Shiloh again with chapter six. Night in West Virginia is as dark as black can be. No car lights sweeping across my walls or ceiling like when I stay overnight with David Howard down in Friendly. No street lamps shining in the windows. No lights from next door houses. Where I live, there ain't no street lamps at all. No house close enough to see from our windows. My eyes are open. Anyway, I stare up into the darkness of the living room and the darkness stares back. I'm remembering how once, several years ago, when Ma bought milk chocolate rabbits on Easter for me and Dara Lynn, I'd finished eating. I'd finished eating mine, but Dara Lynn took only a nibble of hers every day or so, keeping it up on her dresser in its pink and yellow tinfoil, driving me nuts. And one day I just crept in there and ate off one of that rabbit's ears. Dara Lynn, of course, threw a fit. And when Ma asked me if I'd done it, I said no. I could feel my cheeks and neck burning red. You see, Marty, she asked, I'd only nodded and left the room. Oh, no. You sure, Marty, she asked. I'd only nodded and left the room. It was one of the worst days of my life. About an hour later, she come out on the porch where I was pushing myself slow in the swing and sat down beside me. You know, Marty, she said, Dara Lynn don't know who ate the ear off her candy rabbit, and I don't know who did it. But Jesus does. Jesus knows. And right this very minute, Jesus is looking down with the saddest eyes on the person who ate that chocolate. The Bible says that the worst thing that can ever possible happen to us is to be separated forever from God's love. I hope you'll keep that in mind. I just swallowed and didn't say anything. But before I went to bed, when Ma asked me again about that rabbit, I gulped and said yes. And she made me get down on my knees and ask God's forgiveness, which wasn't so bad. I honestly felt better afterwards. But then she said that Jesus wanted me to go in the next room and tell Dara Lynn what I'd done. And Dara Lynn, she had a fit all over again, threw a box of Crayolas at me, and could have broke my nose, called me a rotten, greedy pig. If that made Jesus sad, Ma never said. Now, as I study the darkness in the room around me, I'm thinking about lies again. I hadn't lied to Judd Travers when I said I hadn't seen his dog in the yard today. That was the honest to God truth because Shiloh hadn't been anywhere near our yard. But I also know that you can lie not only by what you say, but what you don't say. Nothing I'd told Judd was an outright lie, but what I'd kept inside myself made him think that I hadn't seen his dog at all. Jesus, I whispered finally, which you want me, what, which do you want me to do? Be 100% honest and carry that dog back to Judd so that one of your creatures can be kicked and starved all over again? Or keep him here and fatten him up to glorify your creation? The question seemed to answer itself, and I'm pretty proud of that prayer. Repeat it to myself so, so as to remember it in case I need to use it again. If Jesus is anything like the story cards from Sunday school, make him out to be. He ain't the kind to want to a thin little beagle to be hurt. 
The problem's more fixed up than that. I'm lying to my folks as well. I'm not eating the leftover meatloaf I've put away. Every bit of food saved is money saved that could go to buy Dara Lynn a new pair of sneakers so Ma won't have to cut open the tops of her old ones to give her toes more room. Every little bit of food wasted is money wasted. If we ever have the least little bit of money to spare that doesn't have to go to Grandma Preston's care, first thing we all want is a telephone so we don't have to ride down to Doc Murphy's to use his. But the way I figure, if it's food from my own plate, I would have eaten myself, but I don't. What's the harm in that? Well, next morning, when I get up to see Shiloh, I put the rope on his collar and lead him to the other side of the hill again, out of sight of all but God. Then I let him go, and we race and tumble and laugh and roll, stopping now and then just to lie in the clover, me on my back, Shiloh on his stomach, both of us panting and nuzzling each other. Don't know if Shiloh's getting more human or if I'm getting to be more dog. If Jesus ever comes back to earth again, I'm thinking he'll come as a dog because There isn't anything as humble or patient or loving or loyal as a dog. I have in my arms right now. We eat our Sunday meal, but by late afternoon, storm clouds roll in and the rain beats down on the tin roof of our house, streaming down the window glass, making a small pond on the side yard. I can't help staring out the window at the far hill. Will Shiloh, can be? Can he even leap that fence to try and go somewhere it's more dry? Is he smart enough to go under that lean-to that I'd made for him? Have I built it right? Away from the wind? What if he gets to howling? In 20 minutes, the rain stops, though. The sun comes out. The birds start to sing again. All those worms oozing up through the wet mud. Shiloh stayed where he was, trusting me that where I put him was best. Being quiet, like he knows his life depends on it. Marty, Dad says, going outside with the rage to wipe off his Jeep with a rag to wipe off his Jeep. I saw Miss Howard yesterday, and she said David was back from Tennessee, wanting to know when you boys could get together. She said David would like to come up here someday next week. I like David Howard fine, but I sure don't want him up here. David likes the hill, always wants to play there. He's not afraid of snakes the way Dara Lynn is. David, in fact, likes to go to the very top of that hill and then go running lickety-split down it, racing to see who's first to the fence at the bottom. Likes to climb the trees up there, too, and play lookout. Well, I'll go down to David's uh, tomorrow, I say. I'd rather do that. Well, why not do both, Ma says, coming out to throw some some uh, mash to the hen- to the hands. You've hardly seen any friends all summer, Marty. Why don't you go down to Friendly one afternoon and ask David to come up here another? There's nothing much to do up here, I say, not knowing how else to answer. It was the wrong answer. Both Ma and Dad were looking at me now. You said just the other day you had plenty to do here, Dad tells me, wringing out his rag at the pump. Well, lots for me to do, but not much for David Howard. I say, a lie. That's a flat out lie. Funny how one lie leads to another, and before you know it, 
Your whole life can be a lie. I sit on the porch swing later, not even bothering to push it, and listen to the table being set inside. What you figure is wrong with that boy, Lou? Dad's voice. Uh, just being 11, I guess, Ma tells him. 11's a moody age. Was for me, anyway. You think that's all it is? What pleases you one day don't please you at all the next. What more do you think it is? Don't think he's got that dog on his mind still, do you? Eleven's got about everything on its mind, Ma answers. And then the evening news comes on, and Dara Lynn and Becky come out to the porch, leaving the TV to Daddy. Dara Lynn's got the devil in her tonight, little bit bored with summer, but not quite ready for school to start. Just for devilment. She plunks herself down beside me in that swing and starts doing everything I do. I sigh. <sighs> she sighs. I rest my arms on my head. She does the same. Gets Becky doing it too. Both of them laughing to beat the band. When I have my fill of this nonsense, I decide to go up the hill and see how Shiloh's doing. But as I go down off the porch, Darlin gets up and makes as if to follow me. I stop. I'm looking to find me a snake stick, I say as if to myself. I'm looking to find me a snake stick, Darlin says. I don't pay her no mind at all. Just start walking along the edge of the yard, picking up a stick here and a stick there, Dara Lynn tagging along behind. It's got to have the longest handle and a good strong fork on the end, I say, because that was the biggest, meanest snake I ever saw in my life. Dara Lynn, she stops dead still. She couldn't say all that right if she tried but she's not interested anymore in trying. What snake, she says. Snake I saw up on the hill this morning. I, I tell her, must have been four or five, maybe five feet long, just looking for somebody's leg to wrap itself around. Dara Lynn, don't go to step, a step farther. Becky, don't even come down off the porch. What you going to do when you find it? Darlin asked. Try to keep it from biting me first. Pick it up with my stick. Second, put it in a sack and carry it clear on up the, uh, past the Shiloh schoolhouse. Let it out in the woods there. Won't kill it unless I have to. Kill it, says Darlin. Get your gun and blow its head off. You've been watching too much stuff on TV, Dara Lynn, I tell her. <clears throat> Even snakes got the right to live. I'm thinking, how if I ever become a vet's helper, I got to take care of pet snakes, too. Next day, uh, to head off David Howard from riding up from Friendly on his bike, I go down to see him. I tended to Shiloh first, taking a fistful of scrambled eggs left over from breakfast, a bit of bacon, and a half slice of whole wheat toast that I stuck in my jeans pocket. It's not enough for the dog, I know, but probably more than he'd get from Judd. It's not enough for me either. Sneaking off half my uh, sneaking off half of my breakfast, lunch, and dinner for Shiloh, I'm doing like I'm doing means me going half hungry all the time. But if I eat extra, then it means Shiloh's costing us money, and we can't afford it. I fill my pockets with wormy peaches before I set out for friendly, biting off each piece spitting it out in my hand, 
and picking out the worms before I put it back into my mouth. It pleased me that Shiloh was sleeping in his lean-to when I'd gone up this morning. The ground was dry under there, and I'd brought up some old gunny sacks from the shed for him to lie on. Made it seem more like a bed to him, more like a home. The walk to Friendly takes a good long time unless I hitch a bike. I'm not allowed to get in a car with somebody I don't know. But Dad being the mail carrier for this part of the country, I know most everybody who goes by. The first person to come along this day, though, is Judd Travers. When I hear the sound of a motor and I turn to see his truck a slowing down, I turn forward again and keep on walking. But he pulls up beside me. You want a lift? He sings out. No thanks, I say. Almost there. Where you going? I couldn't think fast enough to lie. David Howard's. Hell, boy, you ain't even halfway. Hop in. I know I don't have to unless I want. But if he's already suspicious about me, thou'll only make it worse. So I get in. Seen my dog yet? First thing out of his mouth. I've been looking over all the roads, I tell him. In answer, no beagle. Well, I don't think he'd stick to the road, Judd says. Not a dog as shy as him. Shy as a field mouse, except when he's around rabbits. That's what the man said who sold him to me, and he sure was right about that. How much did you pay for him, I ask? Got him cheap, because he's shy. Thirty-five dollars, worth a lot more than that as a hunting dog, if I could just keep that animal home. You got to treat a dog good if you want him to stick around, I say, bold as brass. What you know about it? Judd jerks his head in my direction, then turns. Then he turns the other way and spits his tobacco out the window. You never even had a dog, did you? I figure a dog's the same as a kid. You don't treat a kid right. He'll run off first chance to, he gets, too. <laughs> Judd laughs. Well, if that was true, I would have run away when I was four. Far back as I can remember, Pa took the belt to me. Big old welts on my back so raw I could hardly pull my shirt on. I stuck around, didn't have any place else to go. I turned out, didn't I? Turned out how? The boldness in my chest is growing, taking up all the air. Now Judd sounds mad. You trying to be smart with me, boy? Nope. Just asking how you turned out. Somebody who was beat since he was four. I feel sorry, is what I feel. Judd's real quiet a moment. The big old wad of tobacco in his cheek bobs up and down. Well, don't go wasting your sorry on me, he says. Nobody ever felt sorry for me, and I never felt sorry for nobody else. Sorry something I can do without. I don't say anything at all. We reach the road where David Howard lives, and the truck slows down. I can walk from here, I tell him. Thanks, and I get out. But as I come around the truck to cross the street, Judd leans out the window. Like I said, that dog's a shy one. Don't think you'll see much of him near the road, but you keep your eyes out for him in the fields. That's where he'll be, more'n likely. You see him, all you gotta do is whistle. That's what I teach him. I whistle and he comes to me. He gets fed, but he doesn't. Does something I don't like, I kick him clear to China. You see him just whistle, then hang on to him and I'll come pick him up. You hear? I hear, I tell him, but I keep walking.